And we're live. Sorry, everyone. We're a little bit late today, but um, it's going to be worth the wait because today we've got Ross Simmons and we're going to be talking about how to create the best content that's not boring. It's going to make you stand out as a seller, as a marketer, or anyone really on LinkedIn or social. So I'm so happy that Ross is here. But if you've got the ping and don't know what this is, welcome to The Closing Show Live. The Closing Show Live is a weekly show featuring the people of Proposify, sales stars in the trenches, and Revenue Leaders, The Closing Show Live is hosted by me, Nani Milani, VP of Marketing at Proposify. And every week we discuss the challenges we're facing, the no BS lessons that we've learned, so you can crush your close rates. The Closing Show Live is brought to you by Proposify. Get consistency, control, and visibility into your proposal process. Start your 14-day trial today at Proposify.com. So some housekeeping items. So uh, sometimes the live will freeze. If that happens, just press pause and play again, and you'll be back in the stream. You can catch the recording at Proposify's LinkedIn page or at Proposify.com. You can go into the resources page and find all of the recordings, or you can even go on YouTube and just search Closing Show Live and all of our recordings will come up. And to win a prize, we're giving away an amazing 30-minute consultation today with Ross, Whoa, I'm excited by that. But the thing is, is it won't happen until July, but it'll be worth the wait again because Ross is uh, going to give you some really good tips. If you want to win, all you got to do is ask a question in the comments. So just drop a question and we're going to answer the question. Mostly Ross, less me. Uh, and we are going to give that away. So um, are you a social seller? Do you want to stand out? Well, it all starts with content. So we're going to dig deep on how to stop being boring on social um, boring, meaning just boring content. And we're going to go get into it with the Ross Simmons. So you can close more deals. Ross, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Nadia. I'm super excited to be here. Super excited to uh, jump in and share some uh, knowledge bombs with the folks today. It's going to be fun. Amazing. And you're already like commenting in the comments. I love it. So if you want to hit Ross with a question, you can win a 30 minute consultation. And I'm also going to throw in some swag. So I'm also going to throw in a closing show live proposed by nice. swag. You know, when some of them, the merch, just ask us a question and you'll be entered to win. And two updates. We have a the prize wheel at the end, which Hunter, our BDR, is going to spin for the winner. And we have some really cool applause sound effects. What nice. are Ross's applause sound effects, Hunter? I've been talking about it for two weeks in a row. We finally got it. Yes, here it is. Woo! Nice. Okay, so we're going to get right to it. Ross, I want to know, why did you start? Why did you start the foundation and tell me a little bit about the journey because yeah. you created it for a reason because there's a problem out there. I want to learn more about it. Yeah. So foundation is a content marketing firm. We work with B2B SaaS companies around the globe. Some of the largest and most ambitious brands that have fundamentally changed um, the enterprise. Uh, and it all started with just a deep obsession with the internet. When I was a young kid, fell in love with video games. And then from there, I fell in love with this idea of publishing online. So all through university, I ran a fantasy football blog and that paid for half of my tuition. So that was when the light bulbs went off that this internet thing is going to last. But unfortunately, my fantasy football traction in traffic while it was going up my marks were going down and my mom told me to start writing about what I was learning in school which happened to be marketing so I started a blog called rossimmons.com uh, the thoughts of a modern day ad man at the time I was trying to get into the wonderful world of advertising and marketing started to write content about marketing and my lessons that I was learning working with startups studying startups etc and started to just get traction and awareness from people all over the globe I can remember living in my parents' basement, getting an email from a brand um, in Miami, and they were like, Ross, can you fly out and come and talk to our CMO and our team? And I was like, this is wild. I'm all in. And it was at that moment I knew that content was a powerful medium. So um, in that moment, I decided, okay, I'm going to go into this advertising world, learn the game, understand the space. After that, I left and went out and started my own thing. So I've been running a uh, foundation since 2014. Um, and uh, yeah, the problem that we're striving to solve is really around the idea that a lot of B2B brands struggle every single day to create meaningful content. And we have a team of great strategists, writers, editors, et cetera, that bring to life that content and deliver it on a regular basis. Amazing. Yeah. But somebody said like, you know, I'm going to fly you out, um, Nadia today. Um, I'm going to be like, Hey, I need to do more of this, whatever right. that is, especially when like, if I was in my twenties. So I love that story. Yeah. So why do you think content is so boring? So there's like, there's like content from a brand level and then there's like personal branding right? where, you know, there's a lot of like, I'm going to just say it. There's a lot of, sh there's a lot of like really bad. Yeah. Shit. 
there. Yeah, so yeah. Why, why is there so much bad content out there? You know, I think at the end of the day, um, the main reason why there's a lot of boring content out there in the world is rooted in two key concepts that are fundamental to a lot of humans. One is fear, um, a fear of being judged, a fear of putting out content that might be different from um, what people are used to. And nobody really wants to be judged. Like when we are kids, we try to fit in all of those things. Those behaviors are ingrained in us. And they're bad habits that we carry with us even into our later lives as professionals and executives. And I think there's a lot of boring content because everybody is afraid. People are afraid to be judged. They're afraid of being met with a flop publicly and being seen as, oh, look at this. You're a great idea. A creative idea was actually a bad one. Um, people have a deep rooted fear of the consequences of doing things that are actually a little bit different. The other piece that I think um, stems from this is that everyone plays a simple game of, oh, I see you do it, so I'm going to do it the exact same. And a, a cycle starts to begin, and this happens in all areas of um, public-facing communication with brands and clients. It's if they see another brand doing a certain thing, it's very easy for them to assume that that thing would work for them as well. We all saw it with the rise of flat design from a graphic design lens. As soon as one startup decided that they were going to do flat design and that startup happens to be worth billions, the entire economy and the entire space decides that they're going to follow suit. The same exact thing happens with content. Oh, I see that my competitor wrote a blog post of the five things that you need to do to get a job in a certain industry. So we need to write that exact same blog post, but instead of doing five things, we're going to write six. So people get into a cycle of just copying each other and trying to one up each other instead of trying to actually differentiate themselves in the market. And this is why we have a situation where there's a lot of sameness across so many industries and spaces. Sameness equals boring. So yeah. Yeah. And that equals boring because you're, you're just sounding like everyone else. So I want to, I want to unpack that a little bit though. Um, so I, we see a lot of the bad content. We see a lot of people or brands um, just copying others. I see yeah. it with personal brands too, where it's like the right. same thing that's just being recycled and recycled. Right. Yeah. I'm like, I heard that yesterday. Hey, I posted about that yesterday. Right. Right. And I see it again, like three days later. Yeah. That too. But I, you know, so I'm just curious, like, how do you, how do you stand out? Yeah. How do you differentiate? I think the key to really differentiating um, changes over time. In the early days when you're just getting started, you're trying to find your voice. You're trying to figure yourself out. You're trying to potentially even just get that first sale and that first customer. And you're just trying to like break into the industry. So you can do pretty much anything at that stage. Like you can do anything to try to stand out. You're still early. You're, you can throw out wild ideas and identify and potentially find something that sticks. But in most cases, my advice to someone who's very early is to just get in the reps. Get in the reps of creating, get in the reps of actually developing something and truly just trying to find your voice and your tone by actually doing the work of creating. No matter if you're a founder running a company and you're creating your first blog post for your startup to announce you just raised a round or whatever it might be, or you are actually doing this on behalf of a brand that's early on in their life cycle, just put in the reps to start creating and start seeing what your audience resonates with and what your audience actually cares about. Once you start to identify a few of those key insights, like my audience cares about this topic, they're resonating with this topic, start to go down that path and become obsessed. Become so obsessed with that story, with that train of thought, with that idea that it feels like to you that is repetitive. It's repetitive, but in reality, what you're doing is you're fine tuning a message through your own style. I think one of the other pieces of this is through the reps, by actually putting in the practice, you figure out what your style is. If you look back at Ross's blog post from 2014, they sound very different from Ross today because over the time, as you start to produce more and more content, you're going to start to figure out what your voice is. You're going to figure out what your tone is. You're going to start to figure out what your audience wants from you and you get to craft that over time. So my biggest advice to anyone who's just getting started is don't be even intimidated by this idea of blending in. Because at first, you probably will. And that's okay. It's okay to blend in for a little while because as you start to build more reps, you're going to figure out your tone, you're going to figure out your voice, and then it becomes easy to differentiate. Now, when you start to work in a place, in an organization that is a little bit more mature, identifying your story and your voice becomes even more important. 
And the way that you stand out in those cases is simple. You need to understand your audience and go deep in understanding the stories that they resonate with on a regular basis. What do I mean by that? I have this concept that I talk about often. It's called the Sherlock Homeboy effect. I'm not Sherlock Holmes, but I like to call myself Sherlock Homeboy. I put on my um, glasses. I put in my coffee. I drink it back and I start to go deep in researching my audience. And I try to figure out what are the things that are unique about the people who I'm trying to connect with? Where are they spending time online? And what are the stories that resonate with them on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, it's easy for a lot of marketers to say, I'm just going to go and see in Google which pieces this website has published a lot of and is generating a lot of traction. That's one way to figure out content market fit, meaning a market that you're trying to serve has content that they've published and that people actually love. But what gets really interesting is when you start to go into the communities that they're spending time on, go into a subreddit where BDRs are spending time, go into a subreddit where health professionals are spending time, go into a Slack community where copywriters are spending time, or go into a Facebook group with a bunch of Shopify entrepreneurs and see what they're talking about. Once you're in these groups, you're going to try to sort and analyze what content generated the vast majority of the engagement. Which one set the internet on fire? Had everybody talking, all the applause, everyone was fighting, everyone was arguing. Because when you find those topics that got people all fired up, that is content market fit to a T. But most marketers don't take the time to find those stories. But when you find them, those are the ideas that you can repackage. Those are the stories that you can add your own personal spin to that you might even do additional research on and then bring it back to that community. And it just takes off like gold because you've already validated the concept and the idea with the audience that you're trying to connect with. And now the next step is simple. It's time for us to tell this story in our voice. It's time for us to articulate this in a way that is true to us. And then you give it back to your audience and it's going to thrive. Now, that story got way longer than I thought it was going to get. And I don't know exactly what the question was that we started with. Oh, no, I'm going to read you. Long story getting longer. That is the goal. <laughs> I love it. Marketing lessons from Ross Simmons. And, and, and really, there it's, it's personal branding lessons. So even if you're a marketer or not, if you're a seller listening to this, it's, it's social selling as well. It's about building your brand. And I love that. It, so you so you've talked and touched on a couple of things. One is it's, it's about just really kind of just getting out there and trying it. Right. So it's, it's just, you know, creating that muscle, that content muscle. I started posting every day in January. Nice. And it is actually a muscle. So and, and once you start going, the juices start like flowing and it actually becomes, so it becomes a, a consistent habit that you're doing almost every day. And when you stop posting, it's like something's kind of missing because it's it becomes so habitual. And then yeah. it, it does, but it does take some time to get, get, get out there and, and do it. Right. And I, I absolutely went through that journey and it's okay to be the same at the beginning. You said, because at, yeah. the, at the beginning it's, it's fine until you find that unique voice. But when you're right. working for a brand, right. it's really important to start talking to your customers, figure out what what are they talking about? Where do they hang out? You know, even going to subreddits and all that and Slack channels. I love all of that. That is really great. And I want to just remind the audience, if you have any questions for Ross, please leave them in the comments. You can win a 30-minute consultation with Ross or an amazing swag pack from Proposify. So on to the next thing. How do you come up with new ideas for your content? So one thing that I struggled with um, when I started consistently posting is like, oh my gosh, like what do I post about next? Because I had like five right. different themes. And then I remember I would, I would post about them. One or two themes were easier to post mm -hmm. about. But how do you come up with new ideas and what strategies do you use to for, for the creative process? Yeah, uh, It stays fresh. It stays innovative. The key for me is inputs. And when I think about inputs, I'm thinking about the stories, the messages, the, the content that I'm consuming. I want to have as many different inputs as possible to keep me fresh, to keep me thinking creatively. And the more inputs that you have, the more opportunities you're going to have to connect things that other people won't connect. Because it's easy to just get caught up in this idea of I'm going to read all of the same marketing books that everyone else does. I'm going to listen to all the same business podcasts that everyone else does. And as a result, more of that sameness starts to happen. But for me, I love to go down random niches. Like I've read books on how to build castles. I've read books on investing, on music, on the science between, behind gardening. And with all of these things, at first glance, you would think, how in the world does any of that have to do with marketing? What does that have to do with B2B SaaS? 
But it becomes very interesting when you can find similarities to those topics and connect them back to your own world. I talk about often in business around how content marketing is more like investing than people think. And that only came up, that only that concept only kind of became instilled within me after going down a rabbit hole of trying to obsess and learn as much as I could about the world of investing. Um, so what I encourage people to do is don't get stuck in your lane. Don't get stuck in your lane of exclusively listening to marketing content. Find stories outside of your niche, and that will increase your ability to be able to tell stories that no one else is telling. This doesn't just include um, podcasts, books, and things of that nature. Don't be afraid to sign up to go to a webinar or a conference or attend a local meetup with engineers or people that you never would have connected with. Because by going and exposing yourself to these ideas and these concepts and these stories, you're increasing variable inputs that you can then take and spin together and come up with a beautiful idea that the world has never seen before. Because now you have stacked on top of each other a unique perspective that no one else has. And that is why I believe more people need to be going into spaces that they're not familiar with, they're not, they're not comfortable with, and push yourself into these zones because it gives you the ability to truly stand out. Love it. Yeah, no, I, I see a lot of, I think there's like a marketing ad an like analogy for everything. I was watching, right, right. I was watching like a bunch of Netflix documentaries and stuff. Nice. Like, first of all, I used to hate like the sports analogy that everyone right. makes with marketing and sales, but I watched full swing and, and also a basketball. So it was like, full swing is a golf documentary. And then I watched right. like a basketball documentary, like cool. how the U.S. team went to the Olympics. It, and I'm like, it. oh my gosh, marketing ad analogies everywhere. Yeah. Now I understand why everyone compares marketing and sales to, to right. sports. Right. Right. Now it all clicks. But I love that because you can you, that it gives you a different context right. and a different way that uh, of of spinning out your content that sounds unique and fresh. Love it. I'm totally stealing that. By the way, real free. It's yours. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so we have um, another question. So how do you balance creating content that is both engaging and informative? So like, right. there's like the fun stuff that you see, like, yeah. lab, I mean, they do a great job, like with right. the really entertaining content that your yep. sales feed, but how do you like, there is this inf information informative thing that you need to keep, right. as, especially from a brand perspective. So how do you, how do you like mix both and keep them both engaging and yeah. informative? So I think it all starts with your content strategy. You have to update and identify upfront what your strategic objectives are and how you want to be positioned in the market. Once you've done that, what I would encourage you to do is put on your investor hat and start to say, okay, what is our percentage investment going to be in entertaining content, in educational content, and to others, engaging or empowering content. Those are the four E's. And every single time I talk to a partner, a brand, et cetera, I think about content falling into those four categories. Either a piece of content is going to educate people, it's going to engage them, it's going to entertain them, or it's going to empower them. When we talk about educational content, it's that more utility-driven story that's going to help someone learn how to close more deals. It's how to increase your close rate. Those types of assets would be educational. Entertaining content is content that's simply going to put a smile on your face. So it's talking about how BDRs might have had 20 cups of coffee in one day. It's a fun reference or a fun meme or something like that that just gets people laughing. That's entertaining content. Engaging content is when you ask a question that you intend to start a dialogue where you want people to have a conversation on your channels and on your platforms. It could be asking people what they think about a certain topic. It could be showing them two options of an email and asking them which email you think is the most effective to send. It starts a dialogue. And then the final one, which is empowering, is when you start to celebrate other people. You start to showcase your customers, your team, people in your industry. It's the top 20 people in a specific space list. It's the top five up and coming XYZ list, whatever it might be. Those four categories of content will set you up for success every single time. And if you produce, produce a piece of content, that is not educational, that is not engaging, that is not entertaining or not empowering, I can guarantee you that the only thing that you're going to be met with on the other end is crickets because nobody cares. 
Nobody wants to go online and consume content that doesn't fall into one of those four categories. Those are the things that we go to the internet to consume, to either distract us or to help us get better as professionals. And if you can create content that falls into those four categories, it will set you up for success. So when I'm trying to divide and determine what my balance is, it's always a case by case scenario. For a brand in the B2B space, you want to lean heavily on the utility side of things with educational content, and you may want to throw in engaging, entertaining, and empowering as well. If you are in the nonprofit space, you have to go very, very heavy on the, non, on the empowering content. You want people to feel their heartstrings. You want people to resonate with you. It's a whole different play. But if you're a D2C brand selling a quirky new product like boxers or something like that, then lean as heavily as you need to in engaging and entertaining. Make people smile, make people laugh, take inspiration from Red Bull, et cetera. Do all of those things. So it is a case-by-case -case basis, but you have to start by understanding your own goals and objectives and then determine determining what stories you should tell based off of that. Oh, so good. I feel like really charged. I want to go like write some content now, Ross. <laughs> Get me all inspired. So Jennifer Faulkner is on our team. She's a director of brand and comms for Proposify. And she actually just dropped a fun fact that you actually were the very first marketing plan for Proposify way back. I did. You were a tiny, tiny startup. So that is awesome. I think I heard this and I forgot. So that's <laughs> what I hear about the Proposify, the Proposify connection. That's so cool. Yeah. Many, many moons ago, I would love to dig up that strategy and see like what the recommendations recommendations were back then and how many of them still hold true today. Um, it was a lot of fun bringing that piece to life. I still remember bringing it to life. It was a, a massive document filled with a bunch of tactical insights. And I can remember going to a boardroom with Jennifer and Kyle and the so team good. and talking through the entire strategy and plan. And uh, yeah, it's a nice, well, it uh, a nice tool back. We grew like a ton. It and worked, exactly. And, and we got all this, like, we always had really great feedback on all of our content. That's it. That's that, it. It's proof that it works. I, <laughs> I won't doing... take all the credit. I'm not going to lie. Jennifer probably took it and ripped it apart and did her own thing. But yes, I Love it. appreciate so, it. <laughs> from from our get, one of our viewers today. So Cindy Jennings, so um, she loves and believes that ideas are spot on, everything you're saying, but she's not sure how to get started with um, when her comfort level with tech is less uh, worrisome than creative reps. So I think this is more around a tech question. If I got this wrong, Cindy, let me know. But how do you incorporate technology into your content strategy? And especially if you're not super comfortable with doing that. My dad told me from a young age that it's better to have one good kid than two bad. And I think the same advice I'm going to use here. It's better to be really good on one channel than to be super confused and mediocre across all of them. So instead of making the mistake of thinking, I need to be on TikTok, I need to be on Reddit, I need to be on Quora, I need to be on LinkedIn, I need to be on Twitter, I need to be on Facebook, I need to be on Slack, I need to be on Discord. Oh, wow. Just that. Yeah. Stay focused. <laughs> Find one channel that you can be excellent at. Find one channel that you can be great at and ignore the noise because there will always be a new tool. There will always be a new channel. There will always be in the next few years, always be a new AI tool that's going to help you do X, Y, and Z. Just stay focused. Stay focused on the things that serve you. Stay focused on the things that you can do extremely well and ignore the noise. If you can find your way around the, the chaos of all of the different channels and say, I'm going to go all in on LinkedIn then start within that platform and say, okay, I'm going to start by just putting up status updates on a regular basis. Spend a year, commit yourself to a year of just status updates twice, three times, four times a week, whatever that might be. And then challenge yourself the next year to stay committed to LinkedIn, but maybe now you're gonna throw in some video. Maybe now you're gonna throw in some graphics. Maybe now you're gonna go live a few times. Those are the things that you should do to put in those reps because over time it all compounds. It's mm -hmm. just like investing. The more and more reps that you do, the more it compounds and the more and more efforts that you're putting into this single channel, the better likelihood you're gonna see the ROI in the future. So my advice to folks who are kind of, oh, I don't wanna learn all of these new tools. That's fine, don't. Go where your audience is and be great on that channel. Love it. Uh, is that so? Is that also the same uh, for brands? So that's like so. Is that marketers, sellers, and then yeah. also brands? Like same advice for all those use cases. If you can't be great on the other channels, then you shouldn't be there. That would be my biggest piece of advice. Like you don't want to dilute your brand's quality 
expertise, the value, simply because you can't be great there. I do encourage brands, the most strategic effort would be to find as many distribution channels as possible and spread your story across all of those channels. There's no question that that is a better strategy than being singular focus 100% every single time. If you have audience members on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, and you can be on all three and operate at a high level, do it. But if you can't, Figure out where the largest sample size is, what is the largest opportunity, what is the largest potential, and then go there and be great. Um, for brands, I believe in creating a content culture within your organization where experimentation is in the DNA. You want to have a culture where every fiscal, every year, you're identifying things that you want to experiment with. We're going to experiment with um, actually arming our team with the ability to make time in their calendar to create content for LinkedIn. We're going to support our team in Instagram content, whatever it might be. That is something that you need to create and foster, but that comes from the top down. It's not something that's going to snap your fingers and be able to make it happen um, in most organizations. Love it. Um, Sandra asks, I'm super busy and do not have enough hours in the day to keep up on social media. Can you provide recommendations on what I should look for when it comes to outsourcing? Yeah, I think the options on managing your own social media question, your social media channels comes down to, again, it depends. It depends on your situation. If you're a one person shop, if you're a small organization just getting started, if you're solopreneur, blah, 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 that type of a space in that situation, then I would say you're probably not in a scenario where you should be outsourcing the effort. And instead, you might want to do a little bit of a reflection in a personal calendar review and say, okay, where did I actually allocate my time last month? that was low value tasks. What things were I was I focused on and doing that actually don't provide a lot of value to my organization and the company that I'm trying to build? Because if you need new business, if you are trying to build your pipeline, the best way to do that for most small companies is actually on social media because that's where you have the ability to connect with new people and build that pipeline and build relationships, et cetera. So I would start with that personal audit of my own tasks and ask yourself, like, are you spending too much time doing things that you probably don't need to do? Are you taking too many coffee meetings with people that aren't actually going to pay you anything? Are you going and allowing your brain to get picked for things that aren't actually going to translate into anything for you? Are you going to networking events with people who aren't even in your ICP? Are you doing things in your business like the books or whatever that you should be outsourcing to a bookkeeper? There's a lot of different questions that need to be asked before I can give a clarity on that. That all said, that all said, there are a ton of tools that can make you more productive online. Whether you are using a social media scheduling tool, I have a tweet scheduled for the year 2083 and I am not gonna be alive, but it just says I miss you all and it's gonna freak out my kids and it's gonna be funny. It's kind of morbid, but it's gonna be hilarious. And you can do that in the short term too. You can schedule your content in the short term to always be on and make sure that you always have assets. Since I've been on this podcast. I think I've sent out a tweet and I think I might have put up one post on LinkedIn. It's all automated and scheduled to go out in advance. And you can do that too, whether it's through a tool like Buffer or a tool like Hootsuite and things like that. You can schedule your content in advance. LinkedIn just rolled out the actual scheduling function directly in their product. So you don't need a third party now to schedule content on LinkedIn. You find two hours on a Monday, on a Sunday, on a Saturday, and you schedule content for the week. That is a playbook that can ultimately reduce your amount of time wondering how am I going to find time because you can save yeah. it by just blocking it off into a chunk. I agree. And it's, it also it requires the time to block it. Yeah. So blocking for creative thought, blocking for you know idea generation, thinking time, but also to actually like post. So yeah. posting it in advance is, is a great tip. Um, we have another question here. So yeah, you mentioned and, and touched on AI and we know and have seen all of the talk and the narrative yeah. around AI um, yeah. on all platforms, specifically right. Chad GPT, et cetera. So what are your thoughts on AI taking over the world and content creators especially? Yeah, I think when I look at the current state of marketing, and AI, some industries are gonna be way more affected than others. Um, certain roles are going to be completely um, redefined and restructured in the way that they operate. Is AI going to replace um, all of us? No, but if you are a writer, for example, and you are mediocre or bad, you're probably going to get replaced. 
That sucks mm -hmm. to hear, but it's true. If you're a bad writer, AI can create just as good of content as you can. And that's not ideal. It probably sucks to hear that. But if you are a good writer or a great writer, AI is going to give you the ability to create even better content faster than you were before. And that's awesome. That's a great situation to be in because now the time that it would have taken you to create one asset, let's say it took you two hours, it's now going to be able to be created in 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Amazing ROI, not only for the organization, but your own efficiencies, your own effectiveness, et cetera. Everything gets better because you're going to be able to be more productive. That is a huge win for organizations. It's a huge win for individuals as well, especially if you're a high performer. When it comes to graphic design, you can go to a tool like Midjourney today and you can say, send me a picture or show me a picture of an apple pie. And it can give you an apple pie that literally looks exactly like an apple pie that you just put up. I did put a post of this on LinkedIn. Exactly. And the thing is, you can't tell the two apart. So photographers are going to run into a challenge. Stock photo sites are definitely going to run into a channel as these AI tools start to come to fruition. Is there a world where AI is oftentimes going to start to create and pre-write some of the emails that we're sending, going to write the copy for the ads that we have in Google ads and Facebook ads, et cetera? There's no question. There is no question about it. The only thing we can do as marketers, as professionals, as executives, et cetera, is either reject the change and ultimately be left behind or embrace the change and be able to thrive in the future because we were able to adopt. Look, if you're going to retire next year, don't worry. You're good. Just call it quits. Go through the motions. No one's probably letting you go because of AI and stuff like that. If they do, you're going to get a nice severance. You're about to retire next year. But if you're early in your career, these are things that you need to be obsessed, arguably, with to learn because they are going to play a pivotal role in your ability to operate at a high level in your career and in your goals. So is AI going to take over the world? I think it's going to have a fundamental shift in the way that we work. And it's on all of us to take responsibility for our own growth, our own careers, to think through the practices and the ways in which we want to allow AI to serve us. Because it's just like the Iron Man suit. Some of you might not know what I'm talking about. You, you're not a fan of superheroes, Marvel, et cetera. Picture yeah. a superhero putting on a suit that gives them superpowers. AI is essentially that. The mm -hmm. person in the suit still matters a whole lot, right? Like the person in the suit still matters a ton, but the suit will make you better. This stuff is not replacing you, but it will augment you. It will make you better. You just have to have a mindset that goes inside of that suit to have a perspective of how you're going to use it to get better and improve. So very kind of similar to some of the things you said, but like, how do you, so how do you embrace it? I know it's kind of putting on the suit, but can you give like a real life example of how you would embrace AI today? And, and Jerry Kleeman asks the same question. So curious yeah. how AI plays into this using chat GPT for content, for example. Yeah. So I recorded a whiteboard Friday with Moz. Um, you can check that out where I break down um, the future of content workflows and how AI is going to fundamentally change the way in which we manage the content creation process. The a simple way to think about AI and how it will influence the content workflow process is this. You're given a content calendar by your team. Scratch that. You go to ChatGPT and you ask for a content calendar. It gives you that. Now, don't get me wrong. Today, it's not going to be rooted in research. It's not going to be rooted in data. But if you took a spreadsheet in 4.5 ChatGPT and you uploaded it and you said, hey, take this and then identify the topics that have the best opportunity, it can spit back to you the best opportunities based off of the credentials that you give it. You now have a content calendar. Then you say, all right, write these titles for this content calendar in a way that would optimize for search. ChatGPT will do that for you. Then you would say to ChatGPT, for each of these titles that you wrote, create a breakdown and a framework that would make up the ins and outs of that blog post. It would then list all of the headers for all of the different topics and break it down. Then you say, for H1s across the board, please insert a paragraph that is interesting and falls into this brand voice. Blah, blah, blah. You do that for H2, H3, H4. And then you're going to have a blog post essentially written. And then at the end, you say, write a conclusion. You're able to literally do that today with the script, with the spreadsheet. You can make that happen today with an AI like ChatGPT or a tool like Jasper. This is all possible today. You can make that happen and start to create pieces. 
I don't believe truly that if you just run that script and you just get the outputs, you're going to have a good blog post. I think it's going to be pretty bad. I think it's going to be mediocre at best. It's going to sound like everything else that's out there on the web, and it's probably not going to have any personality or tone. Where the value comes from is where you put your suit back on and you start to optimize and improve that asset to take it to the next level. When you start to add a human perspective, when you start to go and do additional research and elevate that content, that's when it gets really special. And that's when you are able to create a bunch of assets that are actually valuable to people, that can actually shape culture, that can actually deliver value that is worth sharing internally. But you have to make the time to go back in and fix what's been done. Love it. That's fire, actually. You mentioned you posted or there's a post about this. Is yeah, it I've written a bunch. I do have, uh, so there's a Whiteboard Friday on Moz's website. If you go to moz.com, Whiteboard Friday, Ross Simmons, you'll find it. But also on Foundation's website, foundationinc.co, we have a section called The Lab. And in The Lab, I've created a handful of pieces um, all about ChatGPT and how you can use it to kind of create these scripts. There's even a reference to the sequence that you can write in your script to make all of this happen. Um, so check out the lab. Um, there's a ton of great content on there. And one of my colleagues recently wrote a piece all around prompt and prompt engineering, which I would also encourage people to check out. So good. So good. Okay. So like time always flies in the show and I'm going to have, <laughs> I'm going to ask one of my questions that I yeah. get all a lot. I get asked a lot as a marketer and uh, I'm sure you do too, but like how, what's the best way of measuring your content success? Like, yeah. especially when it's a long game, it's not the short game and like, people, yeah. you know, you're bored usually and your executive yeah. team wants like ROI. Yeah. So how do you, what's, what's the best way of doing that? The best way to track whether or not you're successful as a marketer is going back to the original strategy and the plan that you identified and asking yourself whether or not you're achieving those goals. The goals that you have as a marketer within Proposify is gonna be very different from the marketing goals of somebody working at a Nestle, working at a Salesforce, et cetera, because every organization is different. So it has to start with giving yourself and getting buy-in from leadership that this is the metric that I'm going to move and this is the needle that I'm going to move. Are you aligned with me that this is the metric that I need to care about most? For some people, it's gonna be MQLs. For some people, it's just going to be impressions inside of the SERP. For some people, it's going to be referral traffic. For some people, it's going to be shortening the, the time from contact to close. Some people, it's going to be um, sales uh, accepted leads. For some people, it might just be traffic. Every business is so different. For me and the metrics that I care the most about, I want to be as close to the dollar as possible. And I want to be able to see and identify how the activities and the efforts that we are investing in are going to connect back to the revenue, to the growth, to the opportunities that we want to capitalize and seize and be as close to the dollar as possible. Because I believe being close to the dollar is the best way to secure longevity within a marketing career. That's my long story getting a little bit longer around how I would approach the metrics. Oh, Start with it. the organization, but in your career, try to get as close to the dollar as possible. Yeah, it's always about the metric and what you're going to be moving. So I totally agree yeah. with that. Um, so the other question I had was around uh, content, uh, content creators and just like collaborating with the content creator economy. Like what's the best way of doing that as a brand? Like sometimes everyone's like, especially the B2B space, it's a little mm. bit different. So just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think the best way to collaborate in the B2B space is to do exactly what you folks are doing. Like this is an example of it. You find people who have value to add to your audience. You collaborate, you reach out, and you find ways to make it a win-win for, for both parties. That's what it comes down to. There's a ton of great creators online that have audiences. There's a ton of great newsletters online that have great audiences. There's a lot of marketers and brands who just have exclusive LinkedIn pages that are dedicated to stories that they want to tell for a certain niche. Those are all opportunities that people should be taking advantage of. Podcasting, one of the most amazing opportunities today to reach out and start to do a podcast tour on different creators and websites and podcasts, newsletter, podcasts, whatever it might be. That is an opportunity. There is so much opportunity for collaboration. You can become exhausted thinking about how much potential there is, but the best way to do it is, as we talked about earlier, just get in the reps, reach out, make it a win-win, let your creators create at the same time. And what I mean by that is don't try to dictate the terms of the engagement and the story that gets told, the way it's messaged. They know their audience. They know their voice. They know their brand. They know who they're talking to. Let them do their thing. Give them the creative freedom to do what they can do for you. Pay them, of course. 
but make that opportunity happen. And I think you'll find some amazing results. Don't be afraid to get creative either. I think that's another challenge. It goes back to a lot of the sameness. Um, don't be afraid to reach out and say, let's just do something together. Here's the budget. What do you think we can do? And you might be surprised to see something. Common themes here throughout the show is like, don't, don't lead with fear. Just like yeah. go, go out there and like, you know, build your partnerships, build your collaborations, but also just begin, just start, yeah. start, start building in those reps, start with your content strategy. If you are a solopreneur or you are a marketer for a, a startup, an early stage or later stage, or you're, it's just about getting started okay. and experimenting. I love it. Thank you so much Ross Simmons for, for all of your your points and thanks for coming to the show i can't believe the time is up but we do need to pick a prize winner so um hunter prize wheel hunters are bdr extraordinary he's going to come in and pick a winner of a 30 minute consultation and a, a swag pack from awesome. all right get ready and the winner is Amazing, Afodi, who was very engaged in the session. Thanks so much, Afodi. Awesome. <laughs> Looking forward to chatting with Afodi. It's going to be fun. Amazing. So thanks again, Ross. That was um, that was awesome. If you missed some of the show, just come back to our Proposal Five LinkedIn page. It'll be there, or just YouTube uh, Closing Show Live, and you will be able to see all of our episodes. Thanks for joining us today. Next week, we've got Saad Khan, who's a sales leader at Vendor. We're going to be talking about how to scale your SDR organization. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. See you next time.